The FCPA Compliance Report is the longest running podcast in compliance, engaging a wide variety of compliance related guests and topics. Each week, Tom Fox brings you the top commentators and information which will inform your compliance program going forward. Join us again for the top podcast in compliance, hosted by the voice of compliance, Tom Fox. The FCPA Compliance Report is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. This is Tom Fox. I would like to welcome you to a special five-part podcast series I'm doing in conjunction with the Azevedo Sete Law Firm, which is headquartered in Sao Paulo, Brazil. The series is entitled From the Unthinkable to a Culture of Compliance, and it deals with issues important to U.S. companies and other companies doing business in Brazil. In this episode four, I visit with Ingrid Santos and Juliana Moina on the Me Too movement and sexual harassment in Brazil. This special five-part podcast series on From the Unthinkable to a Culture of Compliance is a special production of the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back for another episode, and today you're in for a double treat because I have with me Ingrid Santos and Juliana Bonilla. Sorry for that butcher in Portuguese. Nevertheless, uh, we are here to talk about Me Too in Brazil and what that means for uh, companies working there. So social media, but also in mainstream media, is that a topic that's really well known uh, both culturally and legally in Brazil now? Well, the Me Too movement uh, went viral in 2017. However, its origins date back to 2006. Julia, would you like to introduce the topic for us? Yes, of course, Ingrid. Well, Tom, frequently we hear about the Me Too movement. However, many people do not know how it started, so we think it is important to understand its origins. The Me Too movement was created in 2006 by the activist Tarana Burke as a way to help women that suffered from sexual violence, especially young and black women. The goal was to create a support network for survivors and to think about solutions to prevent the occurrence of sexual violence. The movement has grown a lot since its creation, but mainly after actress Alisa Milano posted on her Twitter account a request for women who had suffered sexual violence to use the hashtag of the movement. This was in 2017, and after that, thousands of women had the courage to share their stories on social media. As to your second question, Tom, yes, there has been increased coverage of this in Brazil. We actually chose to talk about sexual and moral harassment in Me Too cases because in the last few months in our offices, we are dealing with a great number of cases involving this subject, and we recognize its relevance. Today, unfortunately, thousands of women experience moral and sexual violence in several places, including the workplace. In this context... This podcast will discuss some basic legal and cultural aspects related to sexual harassment in Brazil, as opposed to the U.S., in an effort to help listeners understand a few country-specific nuances. So could we start with the legal framework that you work under Brazil around sexual and moral harassment? Sure, uh, this is Ingrid speaking. Uh, The highest Brazilian labor court understands moral harassment as the exposure of people to humiliating and embarrassing situations in the workplace in a repeated and extended manner while in the exercise of their activities. This misconduct can take different forms like behaviors, words, acts, gestures, or writings that may cause damage to the personality, dignity, physical, or psychological integrity of a person, placing in danger his or her job, or degrading the work environment. The Brazilian Criminal Code as well defines sexual harassment as the act of embarrassing someone in order to obtain sexual advantage or favors. The harasser takes advantage of his or her status of higher hierarchy or of superior position inherent to his or her job, and the basic penalty is detention from one to two years. You both work uh, with corporations and other clients, but I want to focus on your your counseling of clients. What do you counsel clients on? What are practical approaches do you suggest they take around these issues? Well, we understand it is vital for employers to create effective mechanisms of prevention, detection, and remediation of any events involving moral and sexual harassment. 
How can a company do that? Well, it can, for instance, set provisions in its code of conduct, perform trainings, maintain reporting channels. Many times, codes of conduct do not mention anything about moral sexual harassment in the workplace. We think it is important for the companies to mention it in written policies, establishing clear do's and don'ts, and indicating the punishments for certain behaviors. This way, it will be clear for the employees that the company will not tolerate harassment. Additionally, companies should focus on training employees, including online trainings. Last but not least, there should be an anonymous hotline so people may report any misconduct they either suffer or become aware of. Even though these mechanisms can be equally applied in American or Brazilian companies, there are other aspects that we'd like to talk about that differ, differ between the two countries. An example is that when addressing internal investigations in Brazil, whether or not related to harassment in the workplace, it is relevant to highlight the importance of the surprise factor in discovery, as opposed to sending out a hold notice like it is done in the U.S., This may perhaps shock U.S. listeners, which are used to the implications of the litigation hold notice. However, the practice in Brazil reveals that the surprise factor is crucial for a successful investigation. To make this issue clear for Brazilian listeners, we would like to briefly explain that the litigation hold notice is basically a notice directed to people, employees, for instance, with access to or in possession of files, documents, or information of any kind that can be used in a lawsuit or in anticipation of litigation. The notice directs um, the employees not to destroy, hide, or otherwise eliminate such materials. In Brazil, depending on the ethical standards of the recipients of a whole notice, sending this out could cause the opposite result from what the discovery tool seeks. That is, People in possession of documents and materials may be tempted to get rid of the evidence, delete emails, exclude relevant records, and talk to everyone involved, perhaps even trying to convince them to witness in his or her favor. They would do so more out of fear of being implicated in the litigation or investigation. Instead of fearing liability for obstructing discovery by destroying evidence, what would happen in the U.S.? Even though the Clean Companies Act does not set forth standard procedures for conducting investigations, our practice has shown that this is, it is better for the person investigating not to be aware of the investigation beforehand. Here in Brazil, this is strategic for the success of the investigation. One of the things I think many American uh, companies struggle with is the cultural differences between the United States and Brazil. And I was wondering, uh, particularly in terms of personal relations, physical contact, and indeed even interactions in the workplace, I was wondering if you, you two could uh, highlight some of those cultural differences. And then how do you counsel U.S. companies or not maybe foreign companies, non-Brazilian companies? Lack of comfort, not only in saying no, but also in accepting it, as if a straight no would sound rude. Based on my short experience of four years living in the U.S., I feel that Americans have no problem in saying no to physical contact or invitations of any kind. Uh, knowing the importance of saying and also of taking a no to avoid harassment situations, we have been working in the local community to disseminate not only awareness of this issue and the importance of constant training, but also the culture of saying no. At the monthly compliance roundtable run by Isabel Franco, there have been many sessions where we have discussed the importance of spreading in the corporate culture in Brazil, the importance of saying no and of accepting a negative answer instead of misinterpreting it as part of a seduction game. A practical advice for foreign companies doing business in Brazil would be to get acquainted beforehand with the local corporate culture, keeping in mind that there will always be differences, but also that clear communication and respectful treatment are crucial for avoiding inconvenient consequences for everyone. So, ladies, unfortunately, we are near the end of our time, but I was wondering if there are any resources you might suggest for a non-Brazilian compliance person or a non-Brazilian uh, uh, lawyer, and then uh, any other resources on the firm site? Well, for general and easy access information on harassment in Portuguese, we recommend reading the manual created by the Brazilian Labor Court of Appeals, available on their website. Other than that, we can be reached through the firm's website at www.azavedosete.com.br, which is also available in an English version. Thank you too, Tom. It was a pleasure. Thank you again. <laughs> 
Thank you very much, Tom. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this special five-part series I'm doing in conjunction with lawyers from the Azevedo Sete firm in Sao Paulo, Brazil. I'm going to link to their website in the show notes, so if you need any help in Brazil, check them out. I hope you will join me again for another episode. This special series has been a production of the Compliance Podcast Network.